Hello, I'm the Dark Master, and I would like to welcome you back to the history of Mississippi. This episode will be discussing the time period we're currently in. As such, this will serve as a description of the wildlife and state of life before the arrival of Europeans to the New World and during the age of Native Americans. The beginning of the Holocene is marked by the end of the Quaternary Glaciations. These melting glaciers left the world roughly the same appearance as it is today. The Bering Strait once again fell underwater, separating North America from Asia, though humans had already crossed by this point. Changes, however, were much more significant in the fauna of the state. The end of the Pleistocene is marked by the Pleistocene-Holocene megafaunal extinction event. This global event witnessed the most severe depletion of megafauna since the KT extinction event. You know, the one that pretty much nuked the dinosaurs, minus the radiation. This event affected all the continents to a certain extent. Africa was the least impacted, only losing a few megafaunal species, such as the giant warthog and a few others. Though this can be explained by the natural background rate of extinction. Areas further away were affected more and more. Eurasia was well off, only losing a little more than Africa. Australia and South America suffered the worst, with Australia using 71% of its fauna and South America losing 82% of its megafauna. Islands suffered even more, but they are far too varied to generalize. North America was the middle child of the extinctions, losing a total of 74% of its megafauna. Gone were the mammoths, mastodons, and gompotheres. No more were the giant xenarthians, like the ground sloth and glypidons. Horses and camels also lost out, despite both being successful upon reintroduction. Also vanished were the predators that hunted these creatures, such as the smilodon, the American lion, the giant sword-faced bear, the American cheetah, and even the dire wolf. Of these, the American cheetah left the form kind of a legacy in the form of the pronghorn, which runs way faster than it needs to be, like way too fast. Nothing can chase it down. What causes mass extinction, you may ask? Well, there are two main theories. The climate change theory and the overhunting theory, also known as the Blitzberg theory, because apparently Germans are the only people who have ever killed anybody in the minds of the scientists who named this theory. Anyway, both of these have significant evidence, so let's start with the first. The climate change hypothesis argues that the glacial maximum plus the swift heating of the Earth afterwards stretched the megafauna to the point of extinction. This hypothesis was formed in the early 19th century and beginning of the 20th century as more and more evidence for ice ages and castafrodicism were discovered. For example, evidence in Southeast Asia indicates that climate change and increasing sea levels were significant in the extinction of its fauna. As with all these theories, the climate change theory has numerous critics. That Many critics argue that since there were multiple glacial advances and withdrawals in the evolutionary history of many megafauna, that it is un implausible that only the last glaciation event would have led to such extinctions. They also point to feral mustangs as others. However, both these criticisms have major flaws. Firstly, previous megafauna communities and previous interglacials lacked the abundance and huge number of bison, which would have served as increased competition for resources for mammoths and other natives. 
Second, feral horses were introduced to a continent largely free of competition. There are no mammoths or mastodons or rhinos or any other thing that's really competing with them. So to say, oh, well, they're successful now, they should have been successful back then, is very irrational. The second major hypothesis, the overkill hypothesis, which posits that humans simply hunted the animals to extinction. They point to the increasing extinction rate as one goes further from Africa. They point to the various islands I've mentioned before. Just like the previous hypothesis, it has flaws. For example, it is very flawed to try and compare more recent extinction events on islands with those dis of the distant past. The Native Americans lacked the technology of, say, the colonial Dutch or English. Also, there's the fact that islands have a far smaller population in general, even when there is no hunting, than, say, on a continent. Now, neither of these theories are exclusive, and I, I do believe that it is very likely that both of these events could have contributed to the downfall of megafauna. Perhaps the Indians just came at the like worst possible time. Perhaps if they had come a little sooner or a little afterwards, the megafauna would have had a chance to evolve some level of resistance and behavior to their newfound arrivals. But it's never going to be known, really. I point this out, this event, mainly because many people like to falsely believe that Native Americans just lived in perfect harmony until the white man showed up, when in reality they probably killed far more endangered and native species than white people in North America ever have. Since we are speaking of them, perhaps this is no better a time to discuss the first people in America, which itself is a very controversial. The very first settlement began when the Paleolithic hunters first entered North America, from the Asian mammoth steppe, via, usually as it's believed, the Bering Lane strand. Beringia was an area of land exposed during the Wisconsin glaciation, which caused the sea level to fall dramatically as more and more of Earth's water was held in glaciers. The archaeology community believes that the ancestors of Indians slash Native Americans slash whatever term you want to use entered Americas at the end of the last glacial maximum, which occurred 20,000 years ago. The exact route is uncertain. Some scientists believe that it is possible that they simply crossed Beringia. Others believe that they followed the Pacific Coastal Route in which they feasted upon kelp. Others believe, pointing to sweet potatoes, that it may have been Polynesians that first came to America. Either way, the route definitely left an impact on natives. Descendants of East Asians, Native Americans split into numerous subgroups with the Nadeen, Inuit, and indigenous Alaskans being quite distinct from the other indigenous tribes. The first well-known group of Native Amerindians are the Clovis culture, which declined along with the megafauna, possibly influenced by the Younger Dryas, and were replaced by the Folsom complex. Let's stop here for now, and I'll discuss that when the next episode arrives. How is life in Mississippi and the Holocene pre-European contact? Well, it's very similar to the state today, but with significant differences. Firstly, a lot of currently endangered species were thriving. Freshwater bivalve, especially, especially. Catfish also probably got bigger, as did alligators, because they weren't as hunted as extensively as they are now. In addition to this, several species no longer found in the state used to thrive. Wood bison remained in the old growth forests of the state, which used to cover almost its entirety. And proud of these worlds were the red wolves and Florida panthers, which are now all gone from the state and are nearly extinct. In fact, one could say that nearly all fauna, except some of the you know, obvious megafauna, were better off before European contact. 
two extinct species of note are the passenger pigeon and the Carolina parakeet, which I wish to discuss because they make interesting, I would say, additions to the avian fauna and were probably highly noticeable during the Indian age. Firstly, the passenger pigeon was once so common that it blanked the skies. Its extinction heavily spurred the conservation movement, which I'll go over much later. The Carolina parakeet, despite its name, was found across the continental United States. In fact, two subspecies are recognized, separated by the old Appalachian Mountain. In our state, we had the Louisiana subspecies, which was more bluish-green and had some what subdued coloration, which sadly did not help it prevent it from going extinct. In fact, it went extinct earlier than the other subspecies, unfortunately. Apparently, humans just never learn, I guess. Hope you guys enjoyed this episode. I'm sorry if my break bothered you guys, but I just needed a breather. Join me next time, or I'll arrow us back to the lithic period in the history of mississippi